at different times, that's the magic of, of this approach is, is we have asynchrony is supported. And our guest today, um, well, I'll just start us on time. Our guest today is Brad Warner, Zen monk, and also punk author and just damn good author writing about Zen subjects. And today we're going to be focusing on two parts of embodied interaction related stuff. One is cogitate this, how, how this kind of process starts in the brain and the body, and also the role is particular around discomfort. And I've asked Brad Warner if he would focus his attention on thoughts around the responses to sometimes sitting Zazen as uh, uncomfortable from it's boring to I don't feel like feeling what feelings are coming up when I'm sitting and doing this. So it might have some insight around these processes for our own design work in these areas. And Brad might not have a damn clue about what I just was talking about because we're talking to different audiences here from spiritual practice of a punk musician and master to uh, design for uh, engineering interactive technologies. Cool, eh? And uh, so without further ado, Brad, let me kick off uh, as we have chatted about is maybe you could just give an overview of what sitting Zen Zazen is and why some people's response to it are initially. This is hard, uh, if not in small part, because it feels like nothing's happening. OK, well, let's see how I can do. Uh, Zazen is usually categorized as one of the many seated forms of meditation. A lot of people who are teachers of Zazen don't even like to call it meditation. And that is because while outwardly it appears to be pretty much exactly the same as any other form of seated meditation, uh, the inward process in Zazen is that there is no goal to your meditation. So you're not trying to do anything. So you're literally sitting there doing nothing. Physically, the practice is, well, you can't really see what I'm doing, but I'm sort of kind of doing it right now. You're just sitting on a cushion with your back straight. You're trying to let gravity hold you up. So you're trying to find that position in which your spine is, is kind of balanced on top of your hips without any, any um, specific effort to do so. Uh, you put your hands in this funny position like this and you keep your eyes open and you usually face towards a wall. So that's that's physically what you're doing. And there isn't much, even Dogen, the great master who uh, founded the, the version of Zen that I study in, doesn't say a whole lot more about it than that. He gives you about a paragraph about it in his instructions on how to do it. Uh, and then he writes an entire uh, book about uh, in the English version of Shobo Genzo is, well, the version my teacher produced is four volumes, each of which is very thick. Uh, so that's sort of explaining uh, Zazen further beyond the, uh, beyond the physical practice of it. So there's a lot that can be said. Uh, as far as discomfort is concerned, you might imagine that a practice where you're just sitting there trying to do nothing would be a breeze because you're not, you're not trying to make anything happen. You're just sitting there. Practicing. But the, uh, the word that Dogen uses for the practice that he did is shikantaza. And shikantaza is a Japanese word because he was Japanese. And it means just sitting. And I always like to explain that, that it doesn't mean just sitting. It means just sitting. So it's very difficult to convey this in, in writing, but in the character, the Japanese language uses Chinese characters to express itself. And the Chinese character that they chose is originally the image of a hammer hitting a nail. So, so it's like the idea of hitting something exactly on, on the right spot. So, so you're just supposed to be just sitting. And Initially, when I was introduced to this practice, I was about 18 or 19 years old. I was a student at Kent State University, and I 
I don't know, I'd read a couple of things here and there about meditation, but I didn't know what it was. And when I first started doing this practice, let's see, the, the, the discomfort initially was, okay, I'm going to sit here. And then after 10 minutes or so, you're kind of like, okay, I'm done. I don't want to sit here anymore, but you're supposed to sit another 10 minutes or 20 minutes. And so just trying to stay still, it can be quite difficult because the mind is in there raging, going, well, I got to do something, I got to do something, I got to do something. And your task at that moment is just to ignore that, uh, ignore the impulses that, that you are constantly feeling during the practice to go and do something else. And so as you alluded to, Boredom is probably the first experience that most people have with the, with Zen practice. Is that it's it's boring. There's there's nothing you're trying to establish. You're not trying to have an experience of bliss or nirvana or enlightenment or even mindfulness or trying to necessarily settle the mind. The mind will settle anyway eventually, but usually that takes quite a bit of time because you've got to go through this process of uh, the mind raging for a while before it ever settles down. So boredom is the first level of discomfort, not just not just wanting to do anything, anything interesting because it's not interesting at all. There's a wall and you're literally one of the one of the phrases for expressing boredom is watching paint dry. So you're you're literally watching paint dry. <laughs> there's, there's there's a wall in front of you, and that's all you're looking at. So that's the initial stage. After a while, and it usually takes months or years before most people get to this point. But after a while, what happens with the brain is is the image I find useful is that it's like you've been let loose in the attic where you put a bunch of stuff up there over years and you've forgotten what it was and so what the mind does is starts to rummage around in in its metaphorical attic and start to find interesting things memories sensations all kinds of stuff and aspects of yourself that some of them are are pleasant, but a lot of them are unpleasant. Uh, you'll remember something or notice a thought coming by that that you didn't want to have, and so the the next level of discomfort is not wanting to deal with all of that. Well, you don't necessarily actually have to deal with it. You just have to sit with it. Now that's what that's what the uh, the practice is asking you to do is to just sit there with it. And I can tell you my own experiences, one of which, well, just a few sort of highlights, I suppose. I, I started studying this practice when I was a student at Kent State University in Ohio back in the early 80s. And I did practice it for about 10 years and then moved to Japan. And I didn't move to Japan to study Zen. I moved to Japan to get a job but I ended up continuing my Zen studies there as well. And I had a teacher who wanted me to ordain and to teach a Zen practice, which was not on my radar, as they say, as the kids say. It was not something I was interested in doing. I had a, I had a job and I was happy with it. And I didn't want to go teach Zen. But if anybody's interested in the story, I can tell it, but, but the short version is my teacher sort of uh, more or less forced me into a situation where I kind of had to uh, or or be a real jerk, you know. Uh, so I, uh, I became a teacher of Zen and at my teacher's encouragement wrote a book about it, which which surprisingly, I was surprised it even got published, let alone became um, successful. I mean, it's not a million seller or anything, but it's still in print after 15, maybe more than 15 years now, and uh, shows no sign of stopping. And it, it Give us the title, Brad. Yeah. The, the book was Hardcore Zen. Uh, that's, that's the title my publishers gave it. I called it Sit Down and Shut Up. So what I did with that was the next book I wrote, I called Sit Down and Shut Up. Um, and uh, since written 
well, I think my ninth, I think it's my ninth book that I just sent off to the publishers a couple of days ago. So, so it's become a career and it's become what I do. But one of my initial experiences in doing this, I had lived in Japan and then I moved back to the United States. Again, nothing to do with Zen at that point in my life. I was, I moved back to, the book had come out, but nobody knew if it was going to, uh, I didn't know if it was going to sell anything. So this was not a career yet. Um, but I moved back to the U.S. and I started getting invitations to go teach Zen at different places. And I was invited to uh, the Milwaukee Zen Center and this was the first time I had tried to lead. This was what they call a session, which I think at this, sometimes those are seven days long, but I think this one was either three or four days long, but you dedicate yourself to just practicing Zazen for several days. And I was asked to come and lead one of these things in Milwaukee. And I don't know what was particularly going on in my life that made this so, but I realized while sitting there that this, and there was absolutely no chance that I was going to have any so, sort of a spiritual experience during this uh, three days, and that the only, that the best I could manage was to sit still and not run screaming out of the room, even though I was the leader of this of this group at this point. And so I found that very instructive because I had to sit there for three days uh, leading this group, even giving lectures and things, just feeling like this is, uh, this is not what I want to do, this is not where I want to be. Uh, and I have uh, forced myself into a situation where I, all I can do is sit still. So sitting, sitting still was, and so, you know, a bell rings and for the next 40 minutes, I'm going to have to sit still. And if, if sitting still is the last thing you want to do, that is a high level of discomfort. But I found that discomfort to be very useful. One of the ways it's useful is that being able to sit through this kind of self-enforced discomfort means that when situations come along from the outside that are full of discomfort and, and difficulty, they are much easier to deal with because I already know how to deal with self-imposed discomfort, which I would say in all cases is harder to deal with than discomfort imposed by someone else. I've never, I've never found a case where, where, it was, uh, where it was not so. So nothing that anybody can throw at me is, uh, is more difficult than what I can throw at myself. Uh, this doesn't mean that I don't ever get flustered or, or upset or, or that I'd never have a difficult time anymore, but, but I, know, I know the level of it, the level of, of, of discomfort you can impose on me. You, you, can't, you can't touch the level of discomfort I can impose on myself, so <laughs> good luck trying. Uh, so, yeah, that's, I don't know, that's it. <laughs> uh, I've got some questions, to, but just okay. touching on that in terms of the level of other discomfort, you've got a, a narrative in one of your books about how this, the side effect of that kind of practice seemed to enable you to not be quite as reactive as other people might have expected when at your actual job um, you released a photo of a component before it was supposed to go out and people around you were like their hair was get set on fire and and you had to kind of pretend for your hair to be on fire just to be polite it seemed like is that would you have put that down to your practice yeah yeah and the situation was i worked for a company who produced a superhero show called ultraman and a lot of people are familiar with Power Rangers. And Power Rangers is basically a ripoff of Ultraman. Unfortunately for the company I worked for, the ripoff became the million bazillion selling blockbuster in America, whereas the original uh, still hasn't done a whole lot in, in America. But just sort of imagine a Power Rangers type of, of character. Uh, difference between Ultraman and the Power Rangers is Ultraman is, is 100 feet tall. So, <laughs> so he's, he's, uh, he's bigger than he could step on the Power Rangers. But anyway, it's basically the same kind of deal. Uh, so every year, 
they introduce a new Ultraman character and it looks a little different. I mean, the, the joke is they almost all look pretty much the same, but, you know, they'll add a little accent here or there. And one year I had assumed, because we'd gotten a bunch of postcards of this character that we'd already introduced it, and so I started sending these. This is a whole, I, I don't know how much people want to hear about arcane Japanese cultural things, but I'll, I'll give you a little bit. There's a thing in Japan of, of New Year's cards. Uh, we, we send Christmas cards. Japan, they send New Year's cards. And there's a deal in Japan that I sort of knew, but I'd kind of forgotten about at that moment, uh, where the post office will actually hold every New Year's card it receives throughout the month of November and December and deliver them all on January 1st. <clears throat> it's something, you know, it's just something the Japanese post office does. And our company was taking advantage of that. And they they uh, prepared all these postcards so that the character would be revealed on January first. Well, I'd forgotten about this, and I was treating these like Christmas cards to our overseas correspondents and, and sending them out, you know, during uh, during December. So somebody put one of those uh, on the internet. You know, they got the they received the card, and they had a website, and they, and uh, whoever it was, I think it might have been my friend Bob Johnson, doesn't really matter, uh, put it on his website, and then that got around to the company that this uh, character had been revealed about a week before it was supposed to. So this this sent everybody into it, it's not it's weird when I when I try to explain this to anybody who's outside of that industry, it just sounds stupid. But so imagine a, a company where something like that is taken really, really, really seriously. So they got very upset that I had done this and demanded that I fix it. Well, actually fixing it was was easy. I uh, It was still daytime in uh, California at the time this happened. So I just called my friend. I said, can you take it off the website? He said, sure. He took it off the website. It was done. But meanwhile, they had convened this giant meeting of all the executives of, of the company and set up this situation where I would be standing in, in the middle of this sort of horseshoe shape of, of these uh, company executives berating me for having done this terrible thing and did I realize how awful this was. And, and what was interesting to me is that uh, I, I couldn't feel it. Um, I should have felt it because this was this was my my job was literally on the line. I was a foreign person living in Japan, so that job was my uh, my ability to stay in Japan, which was the only home I knew at that point because I'd been there for ten years or something. I don't know how many years at that point, but I'd been there for a long time. Um, at that point, uh, was in jeopardy. Uh, so, so had I lost that job, uh, the chances of finding another job were remote. And that would mean I'd have to pack up everything and uh, and go back to God only knows where because I'd left everything in, in America pretty much behind at that point. I didn't have anywhere to go back to, um, you know, move in with my, my parents or something. I, you know, what was, what was I going to do? Um, even that wouldn't have been very easy. Uh, so uh, so this was serious. And I just I had this feeling like everybody's having this this emotional reaction, but I'm not. Uh, there was no emotional reaction. So I found that in order to get through this meeting, the, the best I could do was sort of pantomime a reaction. And I managed to do that successfully and not to look, I don't know, what, what would be the word, blasé? I don't know if that's the word I want, but, you know, I didn't want to look like uh, like I didn't care, but I kind of didn't, <laughs> I kind of didn't care that much. Uh, one way or another, uh, what was going on with these folks. So um, I managed to get through it by just sort of feigning uh, emotion that I didn't that I didn't at that moment uh, feel at all. Uh, but but I found that fascinating because somehow in this practice of again facing my own discomfort over and over and over again for you know twenty or so years by that point. So this is you know. A number of years ago when this happened um yeah what what they were trying to throw at me didn't have didn't have anywhere to to uh, to stick um so uh so that was that's the story of that i don't know which book that's in it's in one of my books <laughs> it it definitely is i don't think i hallucinated it so and you've just confirmed that i didn't so i appreciate that 
Related to that, I mean, that sounds like an interesting pitch for, for you know, do zazen, because if you make yourself continuously uncomfortable for a decade or more, you will not be made uncomfortable by anybody else ever. I mean, that's not a pitch that I hear that often, but actually that's kind of a, an irony in terms of zen is it's, it's not about, like you said before, having a goal, wanting to do what mindfulness does of, of you know, calming down, de-stressing, whatever. But there are these side effects. So in the earlier period, especially when you're talking about sort of this, this early boredom period before you get into the um, other kind of your attic uh, shuffling, how, why did you stick with it? Besides being, you know, um, chokeholded into having to become ordained and, and teach this stuff, sort of before that a little bit, what was what was the the experience that you were having that you trusted it enough to say, I'm just going to do this not doing thing goallessly? Yeah, it's difficult to say, and every time I think about that or try to answer that question, I'm kind of at a, a loss to really say, I mean, isn't this one of these things that cognitive psychologists have discovered is you do something and then later on you, you figure out a reason for it and then you tell yourself, I did that because... Post hoc you know, rationalization. Yeah, see, I knew there was a word for it. <laughs> uh, and, and that's all I got for, for Zotin practice. I, I, I'd grown up partly in Nairobi, Kenya, so I'm, I'm mainly from Ohio. Uh, in the United States, which you know, in the Midwest, a kind of damn uh, cold, that, hmm? damn cold. Yeah, yeah, that and and it's kind of a part of the the country that uh, people outside the U.S. don't hear a whole lot about. Uh, so uh, you know, one of these dumb areas. And I, uh, my my dad had a job with Firestone Tire Company, and was asked to go work in Nairobi, Kenya. And this is when I was a little child. So my earliest sort of childhood memories are mostly from Africa. I can remember a little bit about uh, my life before we went, but not not a whole lot because, you know, I guess I was seven or six or seven years old when we went over there. So um, so I had a lot of my growing up was in Africa. And in that part of Africa, there's a, a a big Indian population. It's something a lot of people who've never been to Africa uh, probably don't know about. But if you look at a map, you can figure out why, because India is right across the ocean from Kenya. So a lot of people uh, immigrate there. And it's, uh, it's so so the Indian culture was fascinating to me that I grew up around. And the African culture, too. But, uh, but there was something about the Indian religious uh, stuff that just caught me. Uh, and my dad had a best friend over there who was an Indian um, guy, and I'd gone over to his house and seen some of the, the pictures on the wall and little statues and things, and seen these temples. And this is this is weird. God is a a blue guy with four arms. What does this mean? So when I um, when I came back to the United States, I, I had not grown up with any sort of religious uh, training. But my family weren't atheists or anything you're just kind of typical i guess there's a lot of people like this who just have you're sort of protestant but you know but nobody goes to church or anything that that kind of a thing and i wanted to find out uh, the the meaning of life and i thought well maybe studying indian religions will, will be something like that and i stumbled into when i was at kent state university the only class i could find that was about any anything even closely similar to Indian religion was a class about Zen Buddhism. So I took this class called Zen Buddhism. So the answer of why I stuck with it is I, this was the first form of meditation I was ever introduced to by somebody who had practiced it. So the teacher was this guy named Tim McCarthy and he practiced uh, Zen since he was, I think he was like 11 or 12 years old when he started, which is just a whole story in itself, in itself which I don't really know. But um, somehow he got introduced to it in the late 50s or early 60s and had started uh, practicing when he was a child. And he'd done it for a long time. And it was really, it was a personal connection I had with Tim that that led me to, I think, 
carry on with this practice because when I first started doing it, I wasn't, it wasn't like, I'm going to study Zen and become a Zen teacher, you know, it wasn't like that, that was my ambition. I just took this class and I started, I started doing this meditation practice and I found it useful. You know, it, it, it helped, it didn't, it didn't solve every problem in my teenage and early 20s life, but it made those problems seem uh, less or seem more manageable. So I kept doing it every day. And there were several times during that period in my in my 20s, probably even into my 30s, possibly, I'm not sure, where I would just kind of give up on Zen because I because I wasn't you know I wasn't on track to become a Zen teacher or anything so this is just something I did and I'd be like well okay don't need to do that anymore and every time that I gave up doing zazen uh, as a daily practice I would find the the noise and difficulties and you know whatnot the churning in my brain to become louder and louder and louder and each time this would happen at least in the, the first few times, I didn't know why. I would just be like, am I not, am I drinking too much caffeine? Am I not getting enough sleep? And, I'm, and I'd try to figure out what was going on and I'd go, oh, I haven't been doing Zazen for a month or whatever it is. So I'd go back to doing it. And this, I don't know how many times this happened, four times, five times that I just kind of gave up and went back. <clears throat> It never made anything better to, to quit doing Zazen, you know. The only thing it would make uh, better would be uh, that I could sleep in later or something like that. But that even that wasn't worth it. Uh, you know, getting up that extra, you know, 20 minutes earlier and doing the practice before I went out made everything so much better that even losing 20 minutes of sleep was, was uh, you know, an, a, a good trade-off. So... Um, so I just kept back on doing it and eventually it ended up being the, the thing I think of it as it's like brushing my teeth. You know, you, you, you're forced to brush your teeth when you're a child and, and you know, probably in, in my case, my mom came in there and stuck a toothbrush in my mouth and did it for me. I can remember that uh, until and, or, or else she would just yell at me to do it myself after, after that phase. And after a while, I started to notice that brushing my teeth was uh, made me feel better, and so I didn't have to be told anymore. And and it was a similar situation with zazen. I, after a while, I realized that zazen, doing zazen every day, made me feel better. And so um, nobody had to tell me to do it. Nobody had to force me to do it. I didn't have to. I often have to force myself to do it because there's still days even now when I just don't feel like it. You know, I'm like. Don't want to do that, but I realized that uh, I got to do it, uh, or, or things aren't going to be okay, and uh, and so I just do it, and it's become rather automatic. Uh, I usually put in about an hour every day, uh, generally forty minutes in the morning and twenty minutes at night, you know, more or less, give or take. Now, I'm not dogmatic about it, but that's uh, that's what I do, and I do it uh, every day, and eventually. Doing that practice, pretty much anyone who does that practice long enough will start to, if you get into Dogen's writings or the writings of other Zen teachers, there's a lot of mystical sounding and weird sounding stuff. There are, there are sort of bigger revelations than simply I'm getting over this discomfort. You start to realize that comfort and discomfort are kind of the same thing. You know, this is, a, this is something that's uh, not obvious at the beginning. But when, when, you know, having practiced it for long enough, you realize, oh, that's just, uh, that's the same thing. The discomfort is the same as the comfort. Uh, it's, it's bodily sensations and bodily sensations take on a whole other meaning. Uh, you know, eventually the entire way I had come to understand the world sort of fell apart. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and that might sound like it's a bad thing. And I think if you if it happens too soon, it can be a bad thing. But I practiced a lot with this and I was kind of prepared for that moment philosophically when everything was going to just kind of uh, shatter. And then I, I, uh, I kind of got through that. And uh, and uh, here I am talking on the Internet. So.
There's there's a lot there, so I'm going to just gently take a few steps from that, if that's okay. Um, especially like how you said you found that Zazen was useful and the way you started to describe it is initially it sounds like you didn't find it useful until you stopped doing it and realized that that was probably the thing that was helping you feel more the way you wanted to feel by its absence made you appreciate it initially. And then you started to connect it more with, yeah, I'm doing it and I'm feeling these good things, so I'm going to keep doing it. Would that be fair? Yeah, yeah. Um because there's a book that just came out, which I have not read, and I can't get the title even right, but I did watch a couple of things about the guy who wrote it, and it's called something like 10% Better. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember the story was this, it was a news presenter. I don't know if he was American or Canadian or British. Anyway, from some English-speaking country. And apparently he had a big meltdown on air one day and because of having this meltdown you know where he basically had a nervous breakdown in front of 40 million people or whoever however many were watching his show uh, he started doing meditation and his conclusion was that meditation made him feel 10 percent better or maybe it's 15 percent better i forget what the title of the book was but so initially the reason i bring that up is initially the the effects of the practice are not, they're, they're kind of subtle. They're not really overt. Uh, people, people, me being an example of it, sort of, I, I expected something spectacular to happen because I'd read a few um, not entirely reliable books before then about meditation practice, and I, I expected that there would be, you know, immediately, you know, upon practicing, there would be some kind of revelation from God or something like that and that didn't happen so as long as my practice was based on expecting something great it, and and not uh, not having that happen it seems sort of useless and and as you pointed out basically the usefulness of it occurred to me only when it stopped and when I quit doing it I go oh okay that's that's useful. And, and I think initially that's what you get. And that's what this guy who wrote the book uh, got. Uh, he, he, he understood that initial process of being 10 or 15 percent better or whatever he said in his book. Yeah. One, of, one of the things, thank you, one of the things we talk about in discomfort design is when you're feeling uncomfortable in any practice, whether it's practicing an instrument, practicing a physical movement in a sport, learning something new, there is that discomfort if it's not easy to you right away. And one of the expressions we've been exploring is just wait, you know, stay with it, just wait and see if you get to the other side or hunger when people are into exploring eating less. It's like, is this going to break you? What happens when you get to the other side of the discomfort? And I was just wondering if, if that, especially when you talk about um, sitting for the longer retreats, was it just, I'm just going to suck it up till it's over because I have to because I'm a teacher? Or was there ever a point of going, what could it feel like if, will this stop? And, and you know, w without me stopping it, is something going to change if I just hang on longer? Well, yeah, it is, it is kind of fascinating. I would say that because the, the retreat I just told you about in Milwaukee was one of many that felt like that. That one was just a, a good example of it. Uh, mm -hmm. it often it often felt like that when I wasn't leading a retreat, too. Uh, so, uh, one thing I heard it called by Shunyu Suzuki, who was one of the great teachers of, of Zazen, is, is it's like self-taught jail. He's, he's Japanese and trying to uh, speak English, so his phrase came out, self-taught jail, like you put yourself in jail, and you see what it's like to put yourself in jail. Because you are, you are kind of, you know, it's it's uh, it's something that if you if it were forced on you would be a terrible thing. You know, I, I've uh, I've talked to people who've uh, been in prison and they talk about solitary confinement, and in a lot of ways the practice of zazen is like you're you're created a situation of solitary confinement. Nobody's going to stop you if you try to get up and leave, which makes it different. But you you put yourself in this in this situation which. If it were imposed upon you on out by somebody outside, it would be maybe unendurable for a lot of people. And so, yeah. So basically, probably during in the midst of it, 
my my uh, feeling was always like, I'm just going to try to get through this. I'm not really worried about what uh, happens on the other side. But I've never, I've never sat a zazen retreat, no matter how uncomfortable. Where at the end of it, I regretted doing it. You know, like oh, thought, oh, this was a big waste of time. I shouldn't have done that. Uh, quite the quite the opposite. It always felt like that was probably the best use of that three days or week or whatever it happened to be that I that I imposed this upon myself that I've ever you know that I've ever done that this was this was really useful. So um, and there's a feeling of uh, there's a feeling that you you get to by doing this practice that you probably not going to get anywhere else and you did mention um learning an instrument i i play bass guitar in a, a punk band and i, I uh, and that in, in a lot of ways that's a similar sort of sort of thing because the initial initially trying to to learn a more complicated piece of music is uh, is frustrating you know and it, it just it it, uh, it mostly feels terrible but if you can get through the period of it feeling terrible, you actually have gained something pretty incredible. In fact, I used to, one of the things I, I still sort of a snarl at my 19-year-old self for is this one, one of the songs in the band that I play with, Zero Defects. I deliberately complicated the bass part and made it a very stand out part of the song so that I so that you know if people who like us expect to hear that you know that thing happen and um, it's hard to play and when I was 19 I wanted to to play this difficult part and I and I came up with it myself and every time we every time we have to do a show you, you know because we reunited we broke up in the 80s but reunited back in 2005 and we still occasionally play and every time I have to get myself back up to speed on that one. Ow. So, yeah, I'm not, if I haven't played for a while, it's not easy. So I have to kind of spend a few days just playing this one little piece over and over. And the, the song itself is less than a minute long. So just, you know, <laughs> to provide a minute's worth of entertainment for, uh, for people who come to see us. I have to I have to spend a couple of weeks going but usually it's more like initially yeah and then it picks up right yeah as the elastics in your hand start to give way again yeah yeah so I'm gonna come back to that related that uh, were you talking about being a bass player you compared and we're going to get to the whole enlightenment thing in a second but warming up to it from there is because uh, people want to know is um, the, the again the playing the instrument when you get to a point though when you've gone through the pain and you're in the in the zone I know this is jazz musicians with within our own you know, musicians have this when they play together, and it's that what I, you quoted Dogen as saying the dropping away of body and mind, and that that seems to be something that's that's you you hit the nail on the head to use your earlier analogy of the character when you are in zazen and your body and mind drop away. Can you unpack that one a little bit more? And you're welcome to use the analogy of, of getting into the jam and space, but go for yeah. it. Well, there's this phrase that Dogen uses. Every, every teacher, well, maybe not every teacher, but a lot of teachers of Zazen will have a, a little phrase that they'll use that they, uh, that they decide. And I haven't, I haven't figured out mine yet. But Dogen's was... Uh, Is it the Zen master catchphrase? Is that what yeah, you're saying? Something okay. Like All right. And Dogen's was dropping off body and mind, Shinjin Datsudaki. And it's, it's this weird cryptic phrase that he uses quite frequently in his writings that he attributes to his teacher. Uh, he, he, he talks about a time when they were, they were sitting and there were a bunch of guys uh, sitting in, a, you know, in China. He, he, he'd gone to China to study uh, Zen. And uh, which was a very difficult thing to do. We, we kind of uh, we kind of think, oh, go to China. You know, in those days, uh, go, going to China from Japan was a very risky thing. You know, a lot of people didn't make it there or didn't make it back. 
is you know, you're going on a rickety little ship across this uh, the Sea of Japan, which is notoriously stormy. Uh, so he did that and uh, studied for a few years. And at one point, uh, his uh, his teacher shouted at one of the other students who was falling asleep, you must drop off body and mind. And the moment Dogen heard that, he he experienced the, uh, the sense of dropping off body and mind. And that was his, uh, his uh, great light, his great awakening. Um, after he started practicing when he was, he, he entered a monastery when he was, uh, we think, 10 or 11 years old. It's the, you know, the, the records from those times are, are pretty vague, but, uh, but he started very young. That wasn't unprecedented in this time, but it was unusual. You know, most, most people didn't do that. A few people would start, but most of them would, uh, would drop out and started that young. Uh, but he kept with it. So, um, so my teacher, Gudo Wafu Nishijima Roshi was my teacher uh, in Japan. And he, his expression, his explanation for dropping off body and mind was that body, let's see, let's, let me get this. He would talk about it in, the, in, in terms of the parasympathetic and sympathetic uh, nervous systems, the parts of the autonomic nervous system. And he studied up on that. I never studied up on that, but, uh, but uh, Nishim Roshi used to like to read books about that. And he was convinced that, um, that what was happening was that the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, which are usually, uh, he, this, is the, this is the gesture he'd always use. He'd put his hands together. And then he'd say, you know, sometimes the parasympathetic is more is stronger and sometimes the sympathetic system is stronger. And if you read, I read enough about books uh, about this and that that is what they usually say, that, that we kind of go back and forth during the day between this. And when this, I mean, I may be getting this backwards, but I think it's when the sympathetic nervous system is stronger is when you feel kind of keyed up and. You got and, it. Yeah, at the extreme end of it would be the flight or fight response yep. in, in animals. And, uh, you know, and there are, of course, lesser versions of, of that, uh, you know, when it's not quite up to that level. And when the parasympathetic nervous system is stronger, you, it's the rest and digest is usually what they say. And it's you just feel like just sitting, you know, sitting around doing nothing. And, and, and you know, during the day, you kind of go back and forth between those two. And Nishimura, she felt that that what. So the sympathetic nervous system in, in Nishijima Roshi's way of understanding it would, would be mind and parasympathetic would be body. Mm. So dropping off body and mind is when the two nervous systems become so, so totally even that there's no sensation of body and no sensation of mind at all. Well, that's nice. Yeah. And uh, and it's it's uh, reality exists in, in between. And he had a lot of uh, Nishimura. She had a whole lot of uh, philosophies based on this that came out of this uh, notion. He would talk about spiritual, uh, sorry, idealism and materialism. You know, right. ideals being a philosophy that emphasizes this mind side, the sympathetic nervous system side of reality as being paramount and the real thing. And uh, materialism being emphasizing the, the um, parasympathetic Five. nervous system side, where the body is the only real thing and, and matter is the real thing. So it's going beyond all of that. And in my in my own experience, such as it is, Nishimura used to always talk about balance, and and it is it does feel like balance and it is rare but there are there are times when it comes into absolute balance and if i could do it i would but i can't but imagine if you could find just the right spot where you could i'm putting a pen on my uh, palm and you could just get that pen but i can't do it obviously <laughs> but uh, but i've seen people who can do this sort of thing you can get that pen and there's only one tiny little spot there's there's one area where it's exactly right where the pen will just stand up and, and just leave it alone and that is is difficult to find because it's so so precise um, but once once you kind of find that precise balance then everything changes uh, perception 
Nishijima Roshi, one of his other things is perception and conception both fall away. You, you're, you're not perceiving. Well, you are perceiving and you are feeling, but uh, neither one is dominant over the other. And this is, this is the, the perfect uh, moment of balance. The, the caveat to that is that you can turn that into a special thing and go, okay, I got to get there. And, and this is the, the danger that all of us who practice uh, face because once having had an experience like that, it becomes very seductive. And, and part of what Zen teachers have to do for their students, well, Koben Chino Roshi was the uh, teacher of my first teacher, was Tim's teacher. And somebody asked him, what's the most difficult part of uh, training a student in Zen practice, and Coben's answer was, after their first enlightenment experience. So once a person has that experience, uh, and, and I went through this myself too, there's a tendency to kind of latch on to it and go, okay, that's the thing <laughs> over there, which is precisely the opposite of what you've been practicing for all this whole time. This goalless practice, this idea of having no goal for your practice, the practice can suddenly become extraordinarily goal-oriented. Uh, and um, without trying Sounds to like your next discomfort level is right there. It's actually into pain now because you're so removed from that gorgeous moment. Is that yeah. fair? Yeah exactly. yeah, exactly. That's it. And and it can, it can feel devastating. You know, it's like uh, being kicked out of the Garden of Eden, you know. Where, uh, a, a, a lot of times when I come across metaphors like that, like in the Bible, being kicked out of the Garden of Eden, I imagine that maybe whoever came up with that metaphor was somebody who'd also had this experience. Uh, and, the big enlightenment and then the kicked out. Yeah. Eating an apple, then you're yeah. done. And then, yeah, and then tried to convey that in, in language that other people would understand. And of course, everybody took it literally and went, <laughs> went completely the wrong direction. You know, so somebody else has to come up with a, another metaphor, and then then the other people catch. You know, this is this is also part of the what. If you study Zen philosophically, you will see, I think, or I've seen, this process happen over and over again, where somebody comes up with a metaphor, and then that metaphor becomes locked in as some sort of a, you know, a, a goal to to achieve, and somebody else has to come up and kick that metaphor in the in the butt and. Uh, and say no. Well, I tell you what, on saying no there, we're going to uh, open it up for questions for a few minutes. But let's park that and have for next time maybe to pick up on um, the, the sense of the enlightenment part and how not to go there, but you get there somehow as mm. this post pain, what do you do after that one? And just if you could touch on for kind of wrapping up this about what you did say, it's not special, it's not over there reality because what you just described with the autonomic nervous system sounds very physical very very real and if i'm reading the material right and the stuff you've written as well it's it's we're talking about this practice takes you to the real the extremely real which is also somehow ineffable yeah <laughs> uh, so what's the question um what the hell, <laughs> like, what the hell well, ineffable? how do you put how do you get to super duper uber real that is other than ourselves and what we can perceive it's bigger than other than but don't try to put words on it but it's still just reality well the the answer is it's you don't do you don't have to do anything this is this this is exactly it and that that part is is probably one of the most difficult to to convey because in my reading of Dogen and, and some other people like him, yeah, I'm trying to think of some other examples, it doesn't really matter. But just some of the people who talk about that stuff is that they're constantly pointing out that there's nowhere you need to be, there's nothing you need to do. Um, and this, this is kind of Dogen's great dilemma because he was, his, when he was a child, he heard this teaching that that everything is perfectly fine as it is so why do we need to do these practices and that's the answer is 
there's no other way to to kind of get to the perfection of it other than doing these these weird practices and and I happen to be very convinced that zazen is the best, but it may be just it, that it's the best for me because there are other ways to get into it. But uh, Nishijima Roshi would, when he when he was asked about zazen, he would say zazen is the easiest way. He would say there are other ways to get to this uh, to this balance, but uh, but they're all more difficult. Yeah. And um, he, he he'd been. Uh, the reason he'd gotten into Zazen practice is he was uh, very athletic as a child, apparently. Mm. Uh, he was uh, he was a track runner and apparently quite good at it. And he had felt this, this feeling uh, during uh, track running that the only other time he'd ever encountered it was during Zazen. Wow. Uh, and and it was just a complete immersion in, in doing something. But you know, track running is, is difficult, and you have to train for it. And you gotta, you know, I, I related to a musician. There, there were there were times playing. You know, I can think of a handful of times when I have been playing where I've just caught that that complete moment. I can remember one Zero Defects gig uh, after we reunited. So this is maybe ten or fifteen years ago, where we just all hit the the mark, and for the entire performance, there was nothing. We could do wrong. Even our mistakes were were exactly what needed to be done at that moment. And and it, but it's it's rare to hit those those moments, uh, and it's difficult because there's a lot of carrying amplifiers and getting big you know, with the people and a lot of rehearsals and and other things. And so zazen, by comparison, is much easier. But um, what's my dog? I don't know what he's barking. At. But um, but uh, the uh, what was I saying? He's doing this that to me sounds like a. He does this occasion where he sounds like a person imitating a dog. So if you, I don't know if you can oh, hear that. This is Ziggy. A person pretending to be a dog, but he's actually a real dog. Boy, roof, roof. Um, uh, Dealing with his incarnation, I guess you know. Yeah, maybe transition. Maybe. But uh, so so, how do you get there? Is is a question and. I think the the zazen practice is is like is is the best way, but it's also it's also not in your control. I just put up I, I do a YouTube channel and the video that I put up uh, I recorded it yesterday because I knew it was going to rain today, so I put it up this morning, and it was about that uh, that very phenomenon. I was trying to talk about the uh, the fact that people would say. Somebody asked me, is Kensho, we call these experiences Kensho, or sometimes Satori, and it means I said they call it Satori. Somebody mm -hmm. asked, asked if this is necessary part of, of Zen practice, and I, I said, no, it's not necessary. Uh, and even if it were necessary, it wouldn't matter because it's not the kind of thing you can, you, you can't make it happen. Mm -hmm. You just sort of, you just sort of learn to be patient enough that you notice it when it does happen. And I suspect that for most of us, um, moments of enlightenment are probably passing us by, you know, several times a day. And and we've just been kind of taught to, to look the other direction. That's the metaphor that Dogen uses. He says it's not that you, uh, you it's only that you are looking in the wrong direction. There's some there's some um, there's some line where he says that. I forgot exactly the quote, but and it's only that you're you're looking the the wrong direction, uh, that uh, that you think nothing has happened. So it doesn't matter whether you consciously notice this or not. You just keep practicing. And Nishijima Roshi was fond of Dogen's um, line that practice, uh, practice and enlightenment are one. So the zazen practice is enlightenment, and. In other forms of Zen, it's often taught that Zazen is a practice that is intended to get you to an experience of enlightenment. But Dogen said, no, that's not that's not the case. The practice itself is enlightenment, whether you notice it or not. Um, so that's, um, yeah, so, so it, it's, it's more of a matter of, of learning to be patient you know, than, than um, making something happen. You know, Does learning. the word quiet resonate with you in that? Like yeah, the quiet 
is useful. Uh, you know, it's so you're quieting and yeah, can hear better. Yeah, although again, it, even quiet can seem like something you're trying to trying force. to do. Sure, but so you kind of allow yourself to notice the silence that's already there. So the silence is present even in the midst of all the noise. You know, if you if you this is the way I like to think about it. The, no matter how much noise you put on top of it, the silence is still there sitting underneath of it. So, so trying to learn to, to get clear enough to notice that, it, it's useful to reduce the amount of, of noise. So it's useful to reduce the amount of thinking that's, that's going on and, uh, and other noises and doggy noises. Hello, Biggie. I don't know what that noise is, but I think it's just the way. Okay. That sounds like a good cue to pause and maybe take a couple questions and then and then you and Ziggy can have the rest of your day if that's okay. okay. All sure. right, fantastic. So folks in the in the chat, if you wouldn't mind putting up your digital paw and then we'll uh, there take any why is my hand up? No. <laughs> it doesn't need to be up. It's okay, it's down. Any questions for Brad before we let him go about the future of your life and enlightenment and feeling better and or not because apparently sitting di discomfortably is also to be enlightened yeah. enlightening enlight doing enlightenment Any questions this is your chance you had a whole list of them prior to this I'll, I'll keep them for for next time so that's that's cool I'm not seeing anything in the chat no Okay. No. Nope. All right. Uh, I think we've covered a lot of ground. I really appreciate it. And as I said, uh, if we can come back to the whole um, enlightenment question about, again, motivation, because one of the questions I'm keen to get into with you and that you've talked about before is around, for instance, um, you've said there's no shortcuts to this, though, either. Even though you can't necessarily predict or plan for special moments, you can't take shortcuts. And yet, there's a whole host of people who, everything from nootropics to religious by psychedelics, which seems anti-precepts, are, are, um, are saying, well, there is a shortcut, and it's really great. And so that's what the next thing about And you can skip the discomfort part and go straight to the hallucination. Yeah, so yeah, this is one, the next one I'd like to talk about when we next we get together, if that's okay. Sure. All right. Thank you so much for sharing this part of your morning with us and uh, and our evening over here and tomorrow in Australia. So um, see you in a few days. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, all.